Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our search and matching seminar. Today, we're very happy to have Matthew as our speaker. He's going to talk about credit freeze, equilibrium, electricity, and automobile in financial markets. We would also like to express our special thanks to the panelists who can join us today. Uh, as a reminder, we will have the talk is 60 minutes and we'll have 15 minute discussion afterwards. Okay, Matthew, the, the floor is yours. Great, great. Share my screen. Hope you can see that. And again, just hop in whenever you like. So this is a joint project with Agat Pranu, who'll be here answering some questions in the chat. And we're looking at uh, understanding equilibrium multiplicity and optimal policies and financial networks. And just to start with a little bit of motivation, financial integration um, has led to a, a, a very dense network of uh, interactions between different financial organizations. So for instance, 23% of bank um, holding company assets in the US are from within the financial uh, system and 48% of their liabilities. Um, this kind of structure you know, offers great benefits and, and a lot of liquidity and uh, a lot of risk sharing, but it also can lead to um, difficulties in terms of systemic risk. And just in terms of the level of financial integration that's been going on in terms of um, you know, movements across borders, for instance, uh, when you look at the, the difference between 2000 and 2016 in terms of foreign investments, it went from 26 trillion to 132 trillion and ownership um, you know, went from about 17% in, uh, to 18% in any equities and bonds up to 27 to 31%. So you know, I think the great benefits of globalization are that you know, we, we have gains from trade, um, it's, it's led to increasing peace, decreasing poverty, there's economies of scope and scale, um, more efficient investments. So there's all kinds of benefits from this, but there's also transmissions of shocks and contagion, which we saw in 2008 play out. And you know, there's various reasons that, that we shouldn't be complacent about that, especially in today's world with um, global supply chain issues. And so we want to take a look here at, at understanding regulation in, in these markets. And I'll just say a couple of motivation statements about financial markets, why we care about them. You know, they're not classical uh, markets in the usual Aero de Brooke kind of sense where you end up with, with nice efficiency. Um, here there's externalities and interdependencies, um, especially because of insolvencies and failures to make payments can actually lead in, in real deadweight losses in the economy. And also investment incentives can correlate the um, situations in which different uh, parties default. And these kinds of systemic risks can lead to cascades of defaults, and they can also lead to self-fulfilling problems where we have um, various forms of you know, bank runs and panics, but here um, you know, there, there can be issues where there's freezes, essentially people are, are not trusting that they're gonna get money in and they can't make payments out until they get money in and, and you end up with a freeze in the system. And we're gonna look at, at two forms of regulation here. Um, we'll talk about ex post. So we're gonna talk about optimal bail pol bailout policies. And we'll talk about that for, for much of the first part of the seminar. And then at the end, we'll, we'll say a little bit about uh, the difference between ex post and ex ante um, and when it is that we might want to use macro prudential regulation rather than waiting and, and doing bailouts. And, and um, we'll also talk about how that depends on correlation structures and um, whether or not the policies are actually symmetric across banks. So there can be situations here where we're gonna get asymmetries. And so the kinds of insights we're gonna end up with today we're going to look at a very simple model and we'll show that there's multiplicity if and only if there's certain types of cycles in the network and we'll sort of highlight the value of indirect bailouts and the resulting complexity that comes out of that and and um, we'll talk about what you know what the what we can say about bailout policies and what structure they have and what we can't say about them um, so some of the complexity we'll say that there's certain parts of them that are gonna be difficult to solve. And then we'll talk about the ex post ex ante um, and identify conditions under which it's better or worse to, to wait and, and bail, bail out ex post. 
and then we'll talk about the incentives um, for correlation and why that can lead to um, optimal forms of regulation actually being asymmetric. So you treat ex exactly um, similar banks who are fully symmetric in all kinds of ways, including their network position, it might be better to, to um, regulate them asymmetrically. Okay, there's a, a large literature um, on this, uh, so I'm not going to try and do a full lit review. I'm just going to pull out a few things. Um, you know, th there's a lot of stuff that people have looked at, at patterns of connections and implications for risk. We're going to build on the model of Eisenberg and Noe because it's it's a fairly simple model, but we're going to pull in the bankruptcy costs from um, a paper I did with Matt Elliott and, and Ben Golub just to, to get some of the discontinuities in multiple equilibria to matter. And then we're going to look at optimal bailouts and we'll have some relationship to um, work by Gabrielle Devange. Um, but we're going to have, uh, she was looking at trying to, what was the best, most central bank to inject capital into if you wanted to spread through the system. Um, here, we're going to actually try to figure out what's the minimal way that you can uh, bail out um, banks when they can actually change the solvency of others and actually change the um, bankruptcies. So the discontinuities here are going to make it much different um, in terms of complexity than what she was looking at. Okay, so simple outline. I'm going to start with just our, some, our model and talk about multiplicity and cascading defaults. Then we'll talk about the ex post optimal bailouts um, and the complexity of those. And then we'll talk a little bit about ex ante incentives and interventions. So the, the model is really simple. Um, and and we, we're just looking at, you know, well, I'll keep calling them banks, but they're any kind of financial organizations that, are, that can have assets and liabilities and potentially um, default on them. And the value of a, of a given bank we're going to look at just as a snapshot. So everything here is going to be static. We're not going to be doing a dynamic model. Um, they have some portfolio value, and then they have debts that they are owed. So bank I has a holdings of debts from, from bank J, and then they owe debts out. So these, those are the um, holdings that bank J has in I. Okay, so... Um, We'll just track those as the, the value of the um, portfolio that they have, whatever investments other than these debts inside the financial system, plus these debts um, in and debts out. And the critical thing in terms of understanding inefficiencies in this world comes from the bankruptcy costs. So the idea here is that if there's a situation in which um, an organization becomes insolvent and has less in terms of its assets than it owes um, and can't make payments, then it will incur bankruptcy costs. And for the purposes of the talk and a lot of the analysis in the paper, we're gonna actually take these to be full. So we'll just assume that the, the payments stop. And you can think of this as a temporary freeze or you can think of this as, as longer term. Um, these bankruptcy costs tend to be um, fairly large and that's um, going to be important for us um, just in terms of getting the multiplicity of equilibria out here. So the idea here is that if the value drops below zero, then it can become insolvent. And what that leads to is um, a situation where the value can actually depend on what debts are coming in and then whether or not you end up having enough to cover your assets. And so you end up with a system of equations and unknowns where the value of, of bank I depends on its portfolio plus the, the assets it has in terms of debts, which are gonna depend on all the bank values as to what they're paying out. So these are essentially the debts in, you know, if we assume full bankruptcy costs, these are the ones that have solvent uh, values minus its um, debts out minus whatever costs it has uh, if, it, if it goes bankrupt at, at this value. And so then what you end up with is a system where, you know, this is sort of well known in this literature, um, you've got values of banks being positively related to the values of others because then they're getting payments in. And so you've got a system of, uh, where the value of any given bank is monotonely increasing in the values of the other banks, and you can have multiple equilibria here. And I'll give you some examples of that in, in a moment. Um, but there's going to exist a complete lattice of equilibria um, just by the, the usual um, Tarski's uh, fixed point theorem. 
Okay, so that, that's just by, by being to background. And here we're going to take these costs of bankruptcy to be potentially large. And you know, these can have all sorts of different forms. They can be fire of sales, early termination of contracts. Um, it could be negotiations that have to go on, delays, legal costs, et cetera. Um, you know, there's a whole series of studies that have looked at, at what the scale of these things are, and they range from you know, somewhere between um, 40 to, to almost 100%, depending on the particular situation or case you're looking at. But um, you know, these can be fairly large. Okay, so uh, Matt, just a clarification: the the bankruptcy costs are key for multiplicity, right? The is the are are what are key? To... The bankruptcy costs are key for the multiplicity results, or because um, in, yeah, yeah. in Eisenberg and Noe, you also have this positive dependency on my value and others' value, I guess. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's so... no multiplicity. Right. Or, so, I mean, yeah. there you can still suppose that that we don't make payments unless we have the money in. And so okay. it's it's sort of, you know, we're just putting it explicitly in saying, OK, mm -hmm. look, um, that this is actually a cost which then uh, can be incurred. But yes, um, you can also have this multiplicity uh, just as long as you're presuming that people don't make partial payments out um, unless they're getting okay. money in. And so it's, it's a question of netting in, in some sense. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, uh, so one of the big important piece of the Dodd Frank was the living wheels of resolution plans. Uh, so maybe it's worth like comment on this somehow. Like I don't know if you want to take that this is yet another reason to to have a resolution plan as part of Dodd Frank and reduce my group's costs, or maybe you want to take the view that uh, it it was not it, it didn't go far enough to to reduce this cost. I don't know how you, how you see that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, you know. Let, let's come back to that a little bit at the end when we when we've gone through some of the issues because I think um, you know there, there's costs and benefits to these kinds of regulations, and so the the costs are that that it it does impose some uncertainty and and some difficulties in terms of how you actually work the legal system in that situation, but it, it can also be very beneficial in terms of of netting things out and and helping the system make it through. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a whole series of things and that can fit into that same discussion when we talk about compression, CCPs, netting, trying to eliminate the cycles, trying to make sure that we don't end up with these freezes. So that I think there's a whole a series of different ways to attack this and it might be best to, to talk about that once we've gotten into some examples and gotten into some of that. But it, it's an important topic and I think um, you know one that this kind of model might help shed light on. So, so let's, yeah, I'd definitely like to talk about that, but maybe let's put it off for a little bit. Okay, so, so the, the idea here is a simple cascade um, just to make things concrete um, would be, okay, a portfolio value of, of bank one is, is 0.5. It owes a debt to, to bank two of, uh, of two. It can't make that payment. Um, so it's, it's payments not made. Um, now bank two would have been able to cover its payment out. It doesn't have the payment in um, and so forth. So the, the idea here is that then that payment does, it gets defaulted upon. Now you could have you know, less than full bankruptcy costs and so forth. And, and effectively here, you know, bank one might make a, a payment of 0.5 to bank two, but it still would, would have to default partly on its and so forth. So you still get cascades. But the idea here is that these things are gonna go um, through the system. And we're just going to assume that once your value is below your, your um, debts out, uh, you don't make that payment. Okay, so, so then you get into these um, simple systems with, with multiplicity, and a key to getting multiplicity is going to be the existence of cycles, and we'll, we'll make that clear in a second, but the idea here is, you know, let's look at this situation. Each bank in terms of the assets pointing in. So the arrows are pointing in the, in the direction that the debt is owed from one bank to another. So bank four owes bank one one. If, it, if bank one gets that payment, it's got more than enough to cover its debt to bank two and, and bank two can cover it to bank three and so forth, right? So you've got a simple cycle and the best equilibrium in this world is everybody gets all their money in, everybody makes all their payments out, the, the system is fully solvent. Okay, what's the worst equilibrium? The worst equilibrium in this situation is that no bank makes its payments out 
and therefore every bank has less value than it's um, what it owes out and everybody defaults. So you've got a situation where if there's a freeze and one of these banks doesn't make a payment that it's supposed to make, um, then it, it's, uh, it, it's gonna cascade and the system freezes up, okay? So um, what leads to solvency in the best equilibrium? What leads to solvency in the worst and other equilibria? That'll be the building block on which we're gonna build the, the um, bailout policies and I'm trying to understand this. Okay, so um, the first thing we're gonna need in order to have solvency in any equilibrium, including the best equilibrium, is that everybody is able to at least cover its liabilities, presuming that they get all their debts in. So nobody's gonna default just regardless of, of what debts are paid. So here, um, that's gonna, we're gonna call that weak portfolio balance, and that's gonna be a necessary condition no matter what equilibrium you're looking at for people to be solvent. Then the next part <clears throat> is going to be, if you want things to be solvent in other equilibria, besides the best equilibrium, then we're gonna have to have somebody who can start chains of payments. And so we're gonna say somebody's unilaterally solvent if their value of their portfolio is at least enough to cover their liabilities, even if they didn't get anything in. And then we can define, so that's somebody who can start a chain of payments. So, so regardless of nobody else is making payments in, they can still make their payments out. And then an iteratively solvent set is gonna be a set such that the, the first set of banks are all unilaterally solvent. And then if they made their payments, that will be enough to get a second set of banks to be solvent as well. And then if those banks make their payment, there's a set for the third set to, to, to make their payments and so forth. So it, it, iteratively, you've got the, that your value of your portfolio plus the value of the, uh, the debts you're getting in from banks in these previous sets are enough to make you solvent <clears throat> that puts you in the next set, okay? So is so, there risk, Matt, can I ask a question? Uh, yeah. Shall I assume that then there is commitment to make payments in the sense that like banks are held to their contracts as long as they are not in default? Yes, so yeah, like yeah. condition two here, a bank, I can say, well, you know, nobody's making payments to me. I, I don't want to repay anybody. Right, 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 right. Well, right those right. kind of equilibria excluded, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here we're going to assume that if you are solvent, you do make your payments. And, and you're right, we, you know, a bank, the first bank might not want to make its payments because they realize they're just paying into a, a dying system and they're not going to get anything back. And so it would be better for them not to make these payments if they could. So that kind of voluntary default is not going to be in, a, in, our, in our portfolio of, of questions. So we're going to assume that if you can make the payments, you do. And it's only... Um, something on your books not allowing you to make the payments that stops you. Yeah. Okay, so, so here's an example of an iteratively solvent set. So we've got a, a network here with a, a bunch of different banks and we've got three cycles going, well, three simple cycles and then a bunch of larger cycles. Um, and this is a situation where bank one, if you look at all the other banks, Bank one is the only one that could make its payments unilaterally without having any injections of capital. So it's got enough to make its payments unilaterally. All the other banks actually need something in to, to be able to pay out. So an iteratively solvent set in this case is one is able to make its payments directly. Then if one makes its payments, now two actually has enough to cover. It owes two out. It's got a value of one, it's getting one in. So one making its payment makes two solvent. So two is the next set of solvent banks. Um, then you get three and five. So two making payments out makes three and five solvent. Then they make four and six solvent, then seven, then eight, then nine. So you've got actually this hierarchy of which banks are solvent depending on which banks have made payments in and out, okay? So the simple proposition then is all banks are solvent in the best equilibrium, if and only if it's weekly portfolio balanced. So that's just straightforward. It says, okay, if everybody on, on paper has enough to get all of their payments out, given all their payments in, then everybody's gonna be solvent and it becomes self-fulfilling. Um, but then if we go to the worst equilibrium, 
um, all organizations are solvent in the worst equilibrium if and only if it's weekly portfolio balanced and there exists an iteratively solvent set that in intersects each directed simple cycle. So what you need is um, to have at least one bank on each cycle be part of that um, iteratively solvent set. And if that's true, then that actually implies that there's an iteratively solvent set for the full set of banks, okay? Um, this, it, it sounds very simple, but it's actually gonna be incredibly useful in, de in designing algorithms to try and figure out what the optimal bail pol bailout policies are. So effectively what we need to do is make sure we can get trigger some bank to be solvent, and then that bank to trigger other banks to be solvent in such a way that we hit every cycle in the network. And if we can, can do I that, we can make sure that the whole system is solvent. Okay. Just a clarifying okay. question. If you go back to your example, Matt, so yeah. if bank one um, um, had like 0.9 instead of one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. then the whole thing means that the uh, cycle wouldn't work, is it? Or even like- Exactly, so, so right. So if, if you change this, this um, value up here from a one to a 0.9, then one can no longer make its payment. Now we've got an equilibrium where everybody defaults because there's nobody who can make their payments without the payments in, and then the whole system freezes up. And so but, then, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, is this uh, also the model in the paper or is this for, I mean, you could, I guess, assume that you make some part of your payment perhaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna assume full default just to make things really clean and simple. But if you have partial defaults where you only make partial payments out, then you just have to check all these definitions extend for whatever payments you make out. And then there's gonna to have to be somebody iteratively solvent given that somebody makes at least their partial payments. And you know you look at all the partial payments that are made and, and do the same kinds of definitions. So it extends logically very simply, but the, the notation becomes a nightmare. But I guess no matter what, there'll be some kind of like a trigger, uh, like you go slightly below a threshold and then, uh the whole system freezes. Exactly, precisely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then what, what we're going to be looking at is, let's suppose we did drop this, you know, this P1 drops down below one. Okay, now the whole system's insolvent. Where's the best place to start injecting capital? So suppose we can give some bank a little bit of capital to make it unilaterally solvent. Where do we want to start? And maybe that'll trigger a partial cascade. Maybe in this particular example, it hit all the banks, but maybe it only hits a few then where do we want to put the second injection? Where, where are the, what's the sequence of injections of capital that we'd want to make to try and get this system going if it's not, if it starts freezing up? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. So Matt, just uh, going back to the Eisenberg and Noe world, uh, they would assume the best equilibrium all the time. That's, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. and in their iterative procedure, that's clear because they, they say, suppose I, can, I make all my, pay, I receive all my payments. Am I able to make all? That's the first step, right? So right, suppose right. I receive all the payment I'm owed, am I able, am I able to make the payment? I specified my liabilities. And yeah. you're going to just, this, the approach you're showing today is uh, departing from that initial uh, Precisely. Uh, so, so part, step, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And I think, you know, part of the motivation from this is actually talking to people, um, you know, in, from Eddie Lazier and other people from 2008 and, and nine. And, you know, when part of what happens in this loss of confidence that happens in the financial crisis is that it's not even clear that you could go, you, you could go from one um, equilibrium essentially to another, where banks no longer are, are believing that they're getting money in. Um, you know, we don't have timing in this model, but you could imagine that I don't believe I'm going to get this money in. I don't make payments out. I'm, I'm holding on to them. Everybody starts holding on to the payments. And this gets a little bit to what I was saying. Um, you know, it, it freezes up. We're, and what we're going to do is just look at that in a static setting where this bad equilibrium, it's possible, you know, that we're in a good market. And then suddenly we, we just freeze up and, and nobody's making payments and nobody can make payments because now they're not getting the money in. And, um, so the model will be, you know, static, but but it's capturing that aspect of. Matt, can I just ask some, uh, jump on on that? Uh, so the, if I remember correctly, the Eisenberg no, they don't have default cost, and there the solution is unique, right? So you don't have. Yeah. Cost. So here, here too, if we have, if we had, um, we we could. Um, so what we have to have in order to get multiplicity 
is something where you don't make your payments out unless you are, uh, you, you don't make partial payments out. So if we allowed partial payments and no bankruptcy costs at all, we'd end up with uniqueness as well. Right, yeah. yeah. And but just on this last point you are elaborating because it seems that in this setup, right? So the idea just a centralized clearing system would overcome this inefficiency of saying, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, I'll, that'll be one solution here is to say, okay, let's just get rid of all the cycles and get rid of, of you know, these large, um, uh, essentially core periphery structures that we see in a bunch of markets and just replace them by, by centralized clearing systems where everybody's just going through one organization and we don't have any cycles. And so um, that will we'll greatly enhance the, um, bailout problem. I mean, basically it's a much simpler problem there, but it it's, you know, comes at other costs. And so we'll talk about that at the end, but that's going to be one, one possibility here is just get rid of cycles. Um, so, and, and I think, you know, as, as I will show you, there are lots of cycles in these networks. So when you look at the, the actual networks, they're full of cycles. And so they are a concern. Um, and, and one way to get rid of them is by putting in CCPs or other kinds of entities that have you know, right. uh, exclusive. Because if you, if on the other hand, if you think that what prevents the centralization is the timing aspect, is that the state are not fully synchronized, then even the condition you had may not be enough to prevent default, right? Because you need. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so effectively, well, you know, effectively here, what we need to do is we, you know, in the timing, um, we would give some bank enough to make its first payments. And then mm -hmm. it would make payments to whatever whoever it owed, and then that would start the system yeah, moving. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Yep. Okay. So so that's the the basic structure, and now let's talk about some of these bailouts in this context, right? So so we need two things. We need to re um, return all these banks to uh, be so weekly solvent. So at least on paper, the best equilibrium is going to work. And then the question is. What's the, you know, so we're going to think of the following problem. Um, we're going to be in some equilibrium. There's a value of all the portfolios plus some transfers that are made in from a regulator. And what we'd like to do is think of the minimal amount of transfers we'd have to put in in order to make sure that these values are greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so what's the minimal way to do that? And just to give you a, you know, a preview of the basic concept and why this is going to actually involve the full network structure. Let's just look out, you know, look at, at um, this situation. So we've got, um, you know, imagine that there's, you know, stuff coming into bank one and we were, this is one piece of a bigger network. Um, but we could think of bank uh, bailing out bank two directly. So if we started with bank two, we would have to put in um, a value of two, a cost of two. To, to make it solvent, right? If it's not getting anything in from one, we'd have to make it um, solvent by putting in two. But instead, if we bail out one first, then that frees up a payment. We only have to put in a half to one, and that frees up a payment of two into two. And so the fact that by, by making one liquid, we actually then get a larger payment into two, that decreases the amount of cost that, that two has. Right, and so then we've we've sort of greased the system, and so the cost actually is 0.5 to bailing out one first, and then two is solvent without having anything. If we started with two instead, it would cost two, and so here's this indirect value of bailouts, right? So bailing one bank out makes payments that changes the the cost of bailing others out, and so then it becomes a an iterative system. Okay, and and this was actually if you look at some of the rhetoric. Um, you know, part of the, the thought of, of bailing out AIG was if you bail out AIG, you're an indirectly bailing out Goldman Sachs and others because AIG had lots of payments that it owed into um, a lot of the investment banks to which it, you know, it, it bought um, insurance basically from AIG. So bailing out AIG first was a way to get a lot of capital into those banks um, without having to in, in directly put the money into those banks. Okay, so it's, it's effect, effectively leveraged. So that, requ that would require that the regulator knows exactly the, the amount. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so, so we're going to make a heroic assumption. Including here. the keys, not only the links, but the right, keys. Right, 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 right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so this is going to be a full information, uh, uh, you know, um, it, this problem becomes even worse with, with incomplete information where you're not even sure where to put the money in and who might be making payments and so forth. Um, and they so have been also part of the controversy with AIG. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. I, th I think that's right. Um, you know, part of it was you, you weren't sure what, whether you really needed to pay them as much and so forth. And then they were paying stuff that they didn't need to pay. So there was all kinds of um, questions. But here we're, we're abstracting away from incomplete information questions and just looking at the structural ones. Yeah. Good point. I mean, you know, here's a picture from um, Derek Cohen Rukni's paper, a recent one, just looking at the OTC markets, and I think it's sort of telling when you look at the 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 dealers, um, the gross notional share. So just the you know space value of all this stuff that they own, it's about ninety six percent. The net to gross ratio is about 0.21, which means that there's lots of cycles in that network, right? I mean, so that that network is heavily cycled where they're, they're getting stuff in and out and the actual notional share um, is, is uh, you know, quite different than the actual net share that they have. Whereas the sellers and buyers, there's other ones on the outsides that effectively just you know, have payments in or out. Um, so in this case, you know, if, you, if you were actually bailing out um, some of the sellers um, that could grease the system by, by leveraging what they already have in terms of their portfolios, and so this kind of core periphery system, these indirect bailouts can be quite, quite useful. And I'm going to come back to talk more about that, um, what, what our model says about that in a moment. Okay. So indirect bailouts may be cheaper to bail out banks that owe a bank than to bail out the bank directly, but this is complicated when there are cycles. Okay. So let's just go back to this example. Now let's drag bank one down so it doesn't have enough to make its payments unilaterally. So now there's no unilaterally solvent bank. And what we want to do is find the cheapest um, bank here. And if you actually look at, you know, just the, the values, oops, sorry, the, the values here, um, you might think, well, look, bank two is really central and it has, it owes a bunch of you know, banks. So there's more money that's going to go out of it. Or bank seven is highly central as well. It's on two cycles as well. So those are banks that it's tempting, it's tempting to sort of say, let's look for the most central banks in this network and then attack them first in terms of the money that they owe out or the, the cycles that they're on, et cetera. But in fact, the cheapest bailout is one. Um, and that happens again, you know, once we've made one solvent, the whole system becomes solvent. If you make, um, you know, two solvent, this can be more expensive, seven is gonna be more expensive. The full structure of this and which banks you wanna hit is, is gonna um, be a, a hard problem to solve. So actually here we're gonna go into a little computer scientist, uh, science, sorry, and uh, I'll, I'll sort of give you the definitions that we need as, as we come along, but first I'll just state the proposition and then I'm gonna talk about what this means. Um, so let's imagine we've got a network, we've got N banks in it and we're in the worst equilibrium. So let's let N banks be the number of banks in these cycles where we've got potential um, worst equilibrium uh, let's suppose we want to find out whether there exists a bailout policy that ensures so systemic solvency and costs less than some amount. So you say, okay, look, you know, can we do it with three trillion? Could we, could we make it, um, can we bail the system out? That's a, a question. Can we do it with one trillion? Can we do it with 700 billion, et cetera? Um, that problem is NP hard, and it's actually what's known as strongly NP hard. And I'll, I'll make that distinction clear in a minute because that's an important distinction in this problem. Um, Can I ask a quick question about these costs? So if you just give every bank a bunch of money, they all make their payments and then you ask whatever surplus back. So is yeah, that yeah. like a bad solution? What's, uh, yeah, yeah. So I think the costs here, what we're assuming is that the costs are, you know, that, that so if I want to inject what you're saying is maybe I inject the, the you know, Two trillion. Um, now that they all clears and they're actually able to repay the the, the money back to me. Um, two things on that. One is, um, yeah, it, we can think of the cost of this as being whatever the cost of making that payment is, and the larger it is, the larger the interest payment. It's not going to come back instantly. Um, and also, it does appear that there is some loss in the system. So I think uh, I can't remember who it was. Um, 
there, there's a paper that looked at how much was recovered and how much wasn't recovered from the US bailout in 2008. And I think they, they, it was somewhere around five to 600 billion that wasn't recovered in the end. Um, but there, there was more than a trillion that was recovered. So you're right, I mean, there, there could be some amount of this that comes back. What we're gonna assume is you still wanna do this in the smallest way possible. Um, Okay, so, so strongly NP hard, um, what does that actually mean? Um, so in terms of complexity, um, NP actually means problems that are relatively easy to check that the answer is correct. So if I actually told you, here's a bailout policy and it works for some amount, um, that would be easy to check. I would just look at whether or not when I put that amount of money into each of these banks, they became solvent and, and the system cleared. So checking that I've got a, a good answer is not hard, um, but finding the whether finding an answer is is hard. And what does is hard mean? NP hard means it's as hard as every problem for which you can check a solution um, with a, um, a, a non-deterministic um, Turing machine. So this is as hard as every NP, uh, any NP problem. So this is what is known. In fact, this problem we're working with is NP complete. So it's in NP and it's as hard as every NP problem. And strong means it's NP hard, even with just a, a limited set of values of inputs. Okay, and what does that mean? That means, you know, sometimes it could be hard if I could play with all the P's and D's in arbitrary ways. I could make you know, some of the P's really small and other ones really large and the D's I could move all around. Um, it's strongly um, hard if I limit that to a small set, we're gonna limit that. In, in, fa in fact, the proof you can do, um, let's just have a network in which each bank owes each one of its partners one. Okay, so a value of one each. So anytime I'm, the network means that two banks each owe each other one. And let's assume that every bank has a portfolio value of less than one. Okay. So you've got a network that's fairly simple, just a, a bunch of banks that each owe each other one back and forth. Every bank has a value less than one. So you need to put some money in to get some bank started. And then it's going to make payments to its partners. And then you're going to have to keep making it. Um, what you can show here is that you need to bail out at least one bank on every link. So in this case, um, each time you, you clear a bank, it clears its links, but then banks have other links that haven't cleared. And the total cost is the total number of edges um, net of the outside assets of the bailed out banks. So this is, uh, it, the, the proof is basically, you need to find what's known as the maximum minimal cover. So a cover is a set of banks that cover every link. So every link has at least one bank bailed out on it. And here, what we want to find, actually, the optimal bailout policy in this particular situation is finding the maximum, the biggest set of banks that, that have one bank on each link. And that turns out to be um, a really hard problem. So minimal cover set problems are notoriously difficult in this sort of the complexity literature. And there's not really good, this is one problem that they haven't found good heuristic algorithms for. So if we're in this full cycle system, it, it's really hard to figure out what's the cheapest way to do it. And just to give you an idea, um, the number of potential bailout policies, because each time you bail out a bank, it changes the, the values of other banks, uh, the order effectively matters. So you, you end up with n factorial policies, and that's in the trillions by the time you're at n15, um, and at 10 to the 18th by the time you've got 20 banks. So if you're in one of these fairly large dealer markets, the number of strategies that you'd have to try and figure out of which bank I want to you know, start with and so forth, um, it just explodes and it's impossible, okay? Hey, Matt, but, this is Randy Wright. Can I ask you a question? Hi, Randy, sure. I feel like I'm in the Politburo and the Soviet dictators are, are saying it's so complicated to allocate resources across these 100 million people. The easy solution is the market solution. It's informationally efficient, for example. Is there not some kind of market solution here? Like the design, who owes whom what and under what contingencies they repay could be part of an efficient contract amongst these agents. 
as well as the network formation could be endogenous. Yeah. So have you thought about exploring, you know, um, different yeah, no, ways? I think that's a, um, well, yeah, that's an excellent. I can hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I, it's a great question. I, I don't think we have a lot to say about it. Um, I think the reason that it's complicated in these worlds is that, you know, the banks are incredibly secretive about who their partners are and what, what their portfolios are. Nobody wants to give that information out. They don't even like to give it out to the regulators. So they balk every time regulations are put in where, you know, you try and make things more transparent. And I think Just that like means the, the former Soviet Union. Well, yeah, I mean, it means that the, the market doesn't really know exactly what the portfolios are. So one possibility would be you try and make this completely transparent. And then you hope that somehow the market can solve these NP complete problems better than, than we can. Right. Um, and, and I don't know that, you know, that, that's a good question. So that's, you know, the question of whether prices can equilibrate and, and find a, a solution to this system. I don't know how that would work. But I think part of the problem is that, that you're dealing with a lot of incomplete information in terms of right. knowing, you know, which My bank... question is a tricky one because, you know, the very fact that you have these banks suggests we're not in an era of the brew environment. So you can't just appeal to the welfare theorems. But yeah, still, yeah, you yeah. might imagine endogenizing the contract space or network formation could help. Yeah. But I'll let you go and, on. Yeah, no, I, and, and, and when we come back, I mean, I think the closest thing to doing that is saying, okay, let's just get rid of the this system where we have these big opaque banks that we don't know what's going on with and we, we can't solve this problem. And instead just put in one big market where everybody clears all these contracts through that market. And that's the idea of a CCP. And then you don't have this problem. And you know, the, um, effectively everybody is just, um, you know, has liabilities in one direction. Um, there's no freezing, there's no multiplicity. Um, you, you eliminate the problem completely. Pat, Pat, I had a Oh, sorry, I had a related question to Randy's. So, so like, not, not going all the way, but have, have you guys thought at all about like, sort of like simple mechanisms, you know, like a lending facility at, at some price or something like that. And, and since you guys have some of the results on the optimality, you could, I guess, see how yeah. close you can get to, to the first best with, with some very simple kind of facilities. Well, or, I, yeah, you know? I mean, so what we can do is we, we will, I'll, I'll take you through those. There's some parts of these problems that you can solve fairly simply. And then there's other parts that are opaque. And the opaque parts are going to be situations where you've got a lot of core dealers, they all owe each other stuff, and you're not sure what's going on. Um, the easier part is when you've got like peripheral banks and you know that they just owe a couple of people money, and, and then it's fairly easy to figure out how to start that problem. So there's going to be a difference between that kind of problem and the other problem. But again, I think, you know, you know um, there can be incentives for the banks to bail each other out as well. So like Safra Kanek has looked at some of that. There's, there's other reasons that, you know, that, that you know, one um, entity other than the government might want to move in and, and make some loans. Um, you know, the government was trying to get Warren Buffett to buy into a lot of, uh, of the zombie banks in 2008. So you try and get private investors to come in and, and bail these out with the promises that eventually they'll recoup all their investments and so forth. Um, so there are ways of doing that, but I think, you know, part of the reason that we're doing this paper is not necessarily to say this is the only way you could do it, but at least to set up a model where we can ask these questions and then hopefully, you know, we can make more, but the, the raw problem of just trying to figure out the optimal bailout policy is a complex one. And then how do you solve it? Well, um, we can, we can go there in a little bit. Uh, Matthew, can I ask a, no, oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I just have a, another related question. So here, if say the network is more complete, meaning or in the extreme, the, the network completely, like all the banks are connected to each other, does that maximize the chance that the bank has access to some bailout funds through some nodes? So in that sense, when the bank, you know, when it comes to designing bailout policy, a complete network where banks are all connected is better. Yeah, so in, in, like the, in this particular proof, um, if you had a complete network, then there you could actually figure out an iterative policy that would um, that would solve it. So for some particular networks, including the complete network, you can in this particular situation you could figure out the optimal policy. So the harder part comes when it's incomplete and not not every. But maybe that also maybe economizes the bailout funds because uh, you know the maximize the chance that uh, directly or indirectly banks have access to bailout funds. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the tricky part about this problem and the reason it seems so complex um, in terms of figuring out these optimal policies is every time you, you take any bank in the whole network, if it makes some of its payments back, that changes, it, it can potentially change everybody else's balance sheet. And so now every time you make a payment, you completely change the system that you're looking at. And so it really means that it's very difficult to figure out an optimal policy because if I, I start with this bank, then it changes the sequence I'd want to go um, from if I started with, you know, I bank one, I bail out first. If I start with bank seven instead, it's a completely different sequence that would follow in a different. And so I have to go to all down all these paths to try and figure things out. And it doesn't, you know, without a lot of structure on the problem, you don't see simpler solutions than that. Yeah, Ricky? So regarding the NP hardness result, right? right this is only hard in the worst case. Right. Uh, this is this doesn't mean that the typical case is going to be difficult. Sure, sure. Right? Yeah. And then the second is that um, presumably this is also sensitive to how you choose to model the bankruptcy costs. Right. Perhaps if I model the bankruptcy costs in a different way, I get a problem that is tractable in the formal sense of not being NP complete. Yeah, I mean, I think um, so. So one thing I think that's um, illuminating about this particular proof outline is this proof outline says, okay, you know, worst case um, is a problem, but this is a very simple structure. It's not one that's completely out of the ordinary when you when you're looking at these. You know, banks tend to have a lot of of part partners. Um, just having these simple cycles means that you're already into um, possibly very complex territory. Uh, it and. Some parts of the structure seem simple, but the core part seems to just be very difficult. And we don't see simple solutions there. So uh, we don't have a way of quantifying how often you're going to see worst case, which I think is always a problem in these kinds of things. But um, the fact that the that worst cases are pretty easy to describe means that they might be robust in some some way. Um, and the you know the partial bankruptcy cost issue is is still you know something that what what we do need to make this work is some non-trivial bankruptcy cost or non-trivial um, amount of of payments that aren't being made out unless you're fully solvent. So so we do need some kind of discontinuity there, and as long as that's present, um, these results will extend. But we you know everything's critically dependent on that. And, and one last point, I, I was curious why you didn't give the following response to Randy, which was. Um, yes, you could use markets, but it would require debt contracts to incorporate the externalities. And if we buy your model, the problem of computing these externality prices themselves would probably be NP hard. Yeah, well, I think that more equity contracts than debt contracts. My yeah, I mean, could, is yeah. on my, my revenues. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, um, you know, we have an extension in the appendix where we talk about, you know, the fact that a lot of this works with equity contracts as well. I think the, the main difficulty that that um, is faced is sort of what information does the market have and can the market properly evaluate you know all the different enterprises and, and figure out where you know um, I, also insolvencies don't exist in the usual market system that we talk about so it's 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 really hard to even know exactly how to start to answer that question so I don't want to extend the discussion, but just to build on Randy's and Ben's point, what about if the regulator runs an auction for fun? Um, yeah, so I guess the question is what, you know, here you're buying insolvent banks, and I guess the question is... No, the, the, the regulator has the funds, and the banks are auctioning for these funds, potentially putting as collateral something of their portfolio. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't know how to answer that one on the fly. So I, I think um, we can think of alternative kinds of policies. Um, what this does is just say, no matter what happens in order to get this equilibrium to be one where there's solvency, what's this minimal amounts that would have to be put into each bank? And this is an NP hard problem. And now whether or not that could be achieved by some market solution rather than a, um, a regulator is something we haven't explored. But I think this just sort of lays out the problem. So think of this as an optimization problem that the market would have to solve or a regulator would have to solve in order for everybody to be solvent. 
and maybe the market could solve it. I, we don't need a regulator, but but I'm not sure exactly what the mechanism would be to do that. It's it's I think it's a fascinating question. We haven't really explored at all. But also, banks don't have objective functions here, so it's kind of hard to answer all these questions. Yeah, I mean, where, it's where some investors really... trying to make money somehow off an auction and so forth. Yeah. So I'm not sure exactly what the, how the market does it, but you know, they, they were trying to get Warren Buffett to come in, you know, assuming he was going to do that. But the, yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. We just don't, uh, we haven't explored it at all. But I think this problem well, will still be a first step in answering that question. Banks must have an objective function. A bank is just an institution, and it's it's depositors a part of a coalition and they have objective functions. So, you know, the optimal banking deposit contract is a well-defined maximization problem. Yeah, we'll, we'll actually talk about some of that in a minute. Um, the, the precedent you might take is, you know, when, when banks foreclose on mortgages, they hate it. They don't want to have to resell the house on the market. They don't want to be real estate agents. They want to be bankers. So having the government auction off these, these things is a good idea. They probably screw it up. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that so so yeah. Um, to move forward a little bit, let we'll leave aside that problem. But I think this sort of says at least what's the minimal amount of injection that has to happen somehow in order to get this the, all the banks making their payments, and then how that could be done privately or publicly, and whether the public could do it better or worse than the private. Um, it, I think it's fascinating. Um, yeah, we have ten minutes left. Just a reminder. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, so let me say a little bit about general bounds. So can you find heuristics that achieve sort of an upper bound on this total problem? And um, you know these indirect bailout values seem a good place to start. And so we can begin to think about you know how much how much if I bank bail out one bank, how much does it generate? And so um, let's think about you know th that. So for instance, we can direct in what's the indirect value of, of a bank? So if we put if we made one solvent it's gonna make a payment of two to two. And then that actually is gonna make two solvent and it makes a payment of three. And so we could say, actually by making one solvent, we're generating a total liquidity of payments of five into the system. So we're generating that payment of two that goes in and makes three, uh, two solvents and so forth. So we get five out of that and it only costs us 0.5, right? So, so we could say that's a pretty good, you know, injection of capital of liquidity that's going to go into the system, pretty small cost. Let's go for maximizing the total amount that's going to be into the system over the cost that it costs us to bail out. So that would be a, a, a simple algorithm that we could follow. And so let's define these indirect values for banks. You know, what are the, the cascading repayments they would induce? Let's rank them based on those values compared to costs and say, what's the best bank for our buck we can get? And bail them out in that order. Now that that that's going to be a little tricky because each time we bail one out, that means that the system changes, and so now we have a new network, and then we have to figure out on the new network what's the cheapest one, and so forth. But that's a well-defined problem. And what you can prove is if you do that, the total cost you're going to pay is no more than half of the total shortfall that you started with. And you can that's a tight bound. In fact, you can come up pretty easily with networks where it's going to cost half. Um, the half isn't, it doesn't mean you only have to bail out half the banks. It could be that you still have to bail out N minus one of the banks in order to get the whole system solvent. So it's not like just a direct thing that says, oh, I just have to do the cheapest half of the banks. Um, you, you might have to do N minus one banks, but it's actually going to cost no more than half the shortfall. And so the, the proof works inductively by showing that there's always a bank that has more value out that you can get out of it than costs that you have to make payments to. And, and if you do that at every step, you're getting at least twice out of what you're putting in and you can show that you get, um, uh, you know, so, so that gives us an upper bound on this. Just questions on that proposition? Okay, so, so that's a, a, an upper bound. Um, limits the cost to half, even if it takes N minus one banks, but it could be start far from optimal. That's not a, that's a pretty myopic way to do things because it's not looking down the chain of what's going to happen um, on the new network and what's the optimal sequence. And you can go through examples. I won't go through examples just in the medium time, but you can show that, that this particular algorithm can do be far from optimal. And we've tried a bunch of different algorithms, like just working with the cost, just working with the benefits. You can show that any one of them does arbitrarily badly in some network. 
So, so finding one that, that does always well is, is pretty hard. Okay, so let's talk about some special networks and just see um, one thing that, that we can get out there. So the general problem could be complex, but financial networks have these structures. So you know, if, if all the cycles are separate, that's easy. You just have to work for the cheapest bank on each cycle. Um, but the other structure where you can make some headway is like core periphery kinds of structures where we see, um, you know, so imagine that you had a, a, a core of banks. Here, I've just got one bank in this picture, but you've got, you know, some other banks that have payments in and out from this bank. What would be the optimal structure there? That in, in core periphery ones where the core bank or the core banks are larger than the periphery banks. So if you imagine that it takes several um, periphery banks to bail out a core bank, but only one core bank to bail out each periphery bank, in that situation, it's actually cheapest to start with the periphery banks and do those first and then go to the core. And in particular, what you can show is if all the peripherals owe um, some center bank the same amount or have the same portfolio values, and central banks need at least two peripherals to be bailed out to be solvent, then the optimal bailout is start with the cheapest peripherals until the center bank is almost solvent, and then either do the remaining on the center or one more peripheral. So you can, you can show that the, the optimal algorithm in this particular case is fairly simple. Um, simple here, I'll, I'll put in quotes because um, it, it still boils down to what's known as the knapsack problem but it's the knapsack problem is a, a one for which there's nice heuristic algorithms for finding what's the cheapest set of the uh, um, uh, outside banks to, to work with. Okay. So, so basically um, that boils down to, to the knapsack problem. Um, but you know, what it says here is if you have this kind of structure that we saw before, where you've got these large core of banks and the periphery banks um, if there's a series of, of peripheral banks that are defaulting, you want to get them bailed out first, then you reduce the amount that you're going to have to inject into the core and then work with the core afterwards, but the core is still going to be a, a tougher problem. And that would work for these kinds of core periphery structures. So Matt, given that this is actually the structure that, that most of the networks have, why do you think that bailouts tend to be guided to the center in reality, rather than where you yeah, yeah. think are the cheapest one. I'm, I'm, I, I read, read your paper, yeah. it's, it's nice, but this conclusion is a bit puzzling. Um, yeah, and I'll give you two answers for that. Um, um, and I'm not sure which is, so one is that the larger, the, the banks in the center tend to be the larger banks that have lobbyists and, and um, will have the ears of the politicians and also they're the ones that are sort of too, too big and too connected to fail. So they're the ones that you sort of think, wow, these are the ones at the center of the problem. Let's get them solvent and then the system will work. And so that seems to be a, a, a logic that, that holds both superficially and because of the potential political power. Um, I would think that, that you know, this idea that it's actually cheaper to get the money into those banks not by just giving them the money directly, but by having leveraged payments come from outside um, is something that, that uh, you know, at least the regulators partly realized um, in 2008. And I think the, you know, the discussion if people really look at the problem carefully would, would have more of that flavor to it. So um, that, that's the best answer I think I can give. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so, you know, Basically, what do we get? We get multiplicity, depends on cycles. Um, indirect values matter. You want to start with the periphery and then the core bailouts are still going to be needed, but they um, could be complex and um, you know, the, that, that's a tougher problem. Um, sort of implications. I think centrality in financial networks is more, I think one big piece here is that it's more than the network position. And the second is that, um, as, as we've sort of alluded to, one way to get rid of this is just get rid of the cycles, right? So any kind of compression you can do or cycle elimination can be valuable and any kind of netting and so forth. And I think the, you know, what are the challenges that, that are, are faced with that? Um, one is that, you know, we sort of have this bird's eye view of the network, 
the players inside the network don't necessarily know what's going on other than you know netting with one counterparty at a time is fairly simple right so if we if there's two of us and we know which which deals we have back and forth it's easy to know but knowing these larger cycles in the network is very difficult for the banks to know and it's even difficult for the regulators to know um, without really good financial information and so that that can you know cause issues um, and i think you know, it, it's sort of one reason that you might want CCPs or some kind of centralized market for these things. The difficulty with the CCPs, of course, is they end up being large organizations that then are holding all the, the um, you know, deals back and forth and end up having to, um, uh, you know, be solvent themselves. And they can be large and you know, if you look at say Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which are were effectively CCPs for some of the mortgages um, in in uh, 2007 time period, um, they were far from uh, well managed, and so that can be an issue as well. Um, in terms of time, we're at time. You know, we we have a other paper that sort of looks at some of these ex ante incentives and whether you want to do this, you know, forward or not. I'm not going to try and go there just because of time. Um, so I think it's probably a good place to sort of leave this just at this bailout problem. And, I, and just to say, look, you know, there's a lot of things that we can now think about in terms of, you know, here's some cost of bailout. Is it better to sort of wait until we get to the situation and then try and get the system going again? Or would it be better to regulate the system ex ante and make sure we don't end up in this? And that can involve changing the network structure or trying to go in and, um, you know, regulate what these portfolios look like to make sure that everybody's portfolio more than uh, covers their their um, liabilities without having to worry about the injections of capital. And I think one one just to put one exclamation point on that. I think a big issue that that sort of we talk about and it's just worth highlighting is, um, you know, a lot of these banks end up with correlated assets, so they end up in trouble at the same time. So there could be a lot of situations where the portfolio values are all in this situation where none of them are gonna be unilaterally solvent. And we end up with this kind of issue um, precisely because their portfolios, you know, the, the, they all are invested in subprime mortgages or whatever the, um, you know, the, the investment of the day is, and, and that can be an issue. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, we'll have our 15 minute Q&A. Uh, as a panelist, you can, uh, go ahead to discuss further if you like. And as a, pa a participant, if you want to ask question, you can either use raise hand future or you can use Q and A. Okay, if I can, if I can start, uh, just a quick thought that uh, you know there was an interesting discussion about the fact that the problem is empty hard and so on, and the people try to think about solutions. But in some sense, maybe it's actually good that it's hard because. If it was simple, then it, banks would be easily kind of figure out which one will be bailed out first, and that can introduce moral hazard. They don't model it now, but in some sense, to create some ambiguity there might be not bad. So if you have like a star, the guy in the center might figure it out. But if you have a little bit more complicated core with cycles, it starts to be kind of a little bit more sophisticated and hard to solve, and empty hard is even better. So I just wanted to highlight potential benefits of the fact that it's empty hard. So let me see if I can paraphrase what you're saying. So you're, you're, the idea here is the the uncertainty to the extent that these banks are actually fearful of the uncertainty and what might happen, um, having that problem not be easily easily foreseen can could provide um, some beneficial incentives possibly. Yes, I'm saying that if you know for sure you will be the first to be bailed out, maybe you will take extra risk. That's like a, something that is not modeled, but somewhere in P, yeah. P, P becomes more risky. If you can't know that you will be the first one or the second one, then it kind of prevents you from taking extra risk. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think, um, you know, in general, the um, question of the network formation problem here, what, knowing um, in, in anticipation of regulation is, is sort of an important problem to be tackled. Uh, you know, understanding how the banks are investing and how they're forming their partnerships, um, anticipating these potential bailouts or other policies, uh, it, it, that those models are, are, are important ones for figuring out what the optimal regulation is. And this is just like one piece of that puzzle. 
Um, oh, oh, good. Sorry. Go ahead, you were first. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm just going to bring some empirical uh, regularity um, um, uh, to the picture. So, so hopefully using your model to, to answer some of the um, regularity. We know from central banks um, uh, exercise and there are a lot of central bank working papers using um, observed um, interbank network um, uh, data to model cascades using the uh, Edinburgh no algorithm and they found there's um, no contagion, no almost very low uh, possibility of contagion or 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 cascade. So um and um, so there are, there are two ways out of this. The one is that is your, your way, which is that maybe there's the bankruptcy cause. Maybe you can calibrate the, their exercise, like recalibrate their exercise again yeah. to see what the magnitude of for bankruptcy cause required to have this type of, type of multiple equilibria. Another way, and people have been looking at it, it which empirically seems to be true, it is. Um, most of these um, uh, neighboring banks or the cycles that you indicate, um, um, they, they seem to be similar uh, 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 in the sense they receive um, uh, negative shocks often at the same time. So the links are formed because they are, they are um, not because just one of them, they're all they're somehow exposed to some sort of common shock. And um, therefore the cycles are, uh, um, this uh, correlated uh, somehow network formation is uh, indicate um, some sort of a systemic risk already. And and another way to go uh, going to try to resolve this issue to, is to model the network, the ex ante incentive to take on risk. You all take similar yeah. risks as your neighbors. I assume you are going to talk about it. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the, the part I, we, yeah. we didn't have time, so I didn't go into that, but we have discussion of, you know, what the temptation of, of you know, basically, you can show that people want to correlate their risks, and the, the, the simple idea is by correlating the risks with your partners, then you're solvent when they're going to be making payments to you, and your value of your portfolio is higher, and, you know, you, you'd rather be solvent in the same states of nature, and then default you're not getting any of the profits and when you default. So you might as well be solvent when you're getting the most payments in from other, other players. And so that gives you a strong incentive to be matching your portfolios. Um, but I think, you know, the, the sort of issue of, of correlation is, a, is an important one because, you know, we, we see that the banks are going to tend to be in distress at the same time. And I think, you know, um, historically, a lot of uh, stress testing was done one bank at a time. And it wasn't done with the correlated risk structures that are really present. And as banks, as central banks have gotten more sophisticated, um, if you talk to them now, I, I know the, you know, the, the Bank of England, the Bank of Canada, Bank of Mexico, a number of these banks are now doing correlated stress tests where they're they're treating the portfolios as a whole and then doing those stress tests more holistically. Um, and that becomes important in understanding the potential for default. Uh, you know, I, the, if you use the simple Eisenberg and Noe model, then you won't have problems if everybody's, you know, um, so you need some kind of frictions in, in a model in order to get potential cascades out. And, and here, you know, we do them uh, fairly simply by some kind of bankruptcy cost, but any kind of friction, whether it be timing or something else could be um, an issue. So, so, so Matt, I had, I had a related oh, question. Oh, sorry. I Oh, I have. Yeah, go ahead. So, sorry, I just was this, uh, a quick question related to KV and uh, Antonio. I uh, was wondering if you had, if you take you know, an actual network of liabilities, uh, if you could contrast you know, the, the cost of bailing out according to your solution versus the cost according to maybe the more naive solution that Antonio said, you know, is used in practice of bailing out the center. Yeah, uh, to maybe to have a sense of the quantitative. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean you can uh, show the value that, of the of, of yeah. the solution you propose. Yeah. So in fact, um, in the paper we give some example. You you can, or I'm not even sure if we if they made it to the paper. I can't remember if I got if we put them in, but you can get that to be arbitrarily large. 
So you give me any number of the ratio that you want the, the cost of the you know, naive policy compared to a different policy, and, and we can get that to be arbitrarily large. So that's by picking the network in such a way that it's arbitrarily large. So the, I guess then yeah. Katie's question comes that, you know, what if you take the network to be like what we observe, say? Yeah, yeah. I mean, with some fixed network and some market. assumptions on portfolios, then it's not clear. And, that, and that's where sort of that one proposition that says, you know, we can bound things by at least a factor of two by using this kind of naive policy. Um, that policy can go arbitrarily badly in other networks, but for some networks, it, you know, that, that factor of two is pretty tight. So that would sort of be the, you know, the bound we would expect, I think, as a, you know, as an upper bound. So Matt, I had a question that's related to this ex ante ex post discussion because there, there really seems to be some notion of a trade off between if you have a network that's I guess not just more interconnected but more fragile in some sense. Like if you take, you know, if, if one bank is insolvent, that can cascade. Also seems to be you know potentially more efficient to bail out or cheaper to bail out afterwards because if you restore solvency to that one bank, then you restore solvency to the entire system. I know that's that's probably an over generalization, but is that like some broad lesson that you're getting from from the analysis? Yeah, I mean, I think you know what what's missing from this analysis would be so here the the problem just becomes simpler and. Um, you know all the all the problems boil down if you just have a, a simple star network the the whole bailout problem is a lot easier especially if if it's you know all these other banks are just dealing either in or out and not having um uh transactions in both directions with the center so you know like a, a simple ccp greatly so, simplifies the problem and you get rid of all these bad equilibria what's missing from our model is you know why do we have many banks instead of one just one giant bank running the world, right? And if, if everything was going through one bank, then, you know, if that bank goes bankrupt, it's a really easy problem to bail it out. The, the question is, you know, it might, um, you know, having one uh, bank run the world probably is not the optimal solution for whatever reasons. And, and we, those are unmodeled at this point. Um, yeah, but I'm interested or, if, you, if, 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 let's say you take the network structure as given, like a simple star or something like that, and then work with the debt structure to try to understand, well, if you have, I mean, some notion of a fragile debt structure, is that also, you know, cheaper in terms of the efficient bailout, the cost of the efficient bailout? Is, is there some kind of trade-off there I think would be interesting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I think, yeah, 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 exactly. And I, I think it, it points to maybe, you know, the, the complexity problem does mean we need some structure to make progress on, on exactly what these things work. But luckily, there's a lot of regularities in financial networks. And so these kind of core periphery structures are useful benchmarks. Uh, quick question. Uh, on the endogeneity of the of the network, I would expect that, for example, every institution in this uh, framework would want to have like a piece of the bailout. So then endogenously, I think it would make sense to empirically observe something that is actually uh, complex. And the other question I have um, is that there is evidence, and for example, you, you show the picture for uh, credit default swap markets. And there's evidence that there's like an excess of collateral in the sense that if you take rules like the um, value at risk, for example, <clears throat> they don't really explain the amount of collateral in these markets. Do you think your, it seems that your framework could be able to help to explain that in the sense that you have these like complex networks and then if there is a bailout that's going to happen, from the regulator side, maybe the regulator will be like unable to identify who is going to actually be bailed out, and then the excess collateral is kind of trying to mitigate those uh, yeah. those effects. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the collateral issue is a fascinating one, and again, one we don't have much to say about. But in, in this kind of world, if you're not sure you're going to be paid by your counterparties, and you're not sure a lot of uncertainty is there, then demanding collateral on these things becomes a natural. Um, solution to that. Um, obviously, collateral is is an inefficient system, and right. I mean, if, if we have these, if, if we have to be posting things that, that, in some sense, put constraints on those investments, then that that can be inefficient in its own right. And so, we'd like to be able to work the system without having to have collateral posted on all these. But it might be a solution that comes into play if. If you're one of these nodes in the network and you're not going to get bailed out directly and you're not sure 
whether your partners are um, going to end up being solvent, you might demand collateral on all these relationships. And then that puts more and more restrictions on those relationships, makes them more complicated, makes them le less profitable. Um, yeah, in your model, it's all unsecured debt, right? Yeah, exactly. Like Everything's unsecured here. And, 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 and effectively, um, you're right, security is is one solution to this and, and it would start you know putting in part or like a central clearing party as in the in the CDS yeah. market right that you kind of net out a lot of the collateral and, and minimize the total amount of collateral to be posted you know? yeah yeah excellent um, okay uh, I think I will end the official recording for now, but you're welcome to stay if you'd like to discuss more yeah. with Matthew. Yeah, well, thank you everybody. That these are wonderful points and, and lots of interesting stuff for us to think about. So great set of comments. Thank you. <laughs>